Dear participants, uh, welcome to FRH's first masterclass called Living Religious Heritage Through a Narrative Approach from Preservation to the Continuity of Creation. This is the first of a series of two FRH masterclasses that will take place now each year uh, with the aim of presenting the network's members with a unique learning opportunity, as well as a space to participate and engage with invited speakers on these very relevant and, and unique topics. Um, I'm delighted to welcome today uh, the two invited speakers, uh, Nigel Walter and Ioannis Polios. Uh, Nigel Walter is a specialist conservation architect leading a Cambridge-based architectural practice working with churches and community groups. Uh, he's also a research associate in the Department of Archaeology at the University of York in the United Kingdom. And Ioannis Polius is an associate professor in living heritage and business in the Center for Heritage Management at the Ahmedabad University in India. So today's session will be structured as follows. There'll be a, a very dynamic uh, intervention, 35 minutes in the first session, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with participants. The second session of 35 minutes, again, followed by 15 minutes Q&A. And finally, a final 15 minutes for uh, open discussion. Uh, you can submit any questions you have via the chat at any time throughout the presentation. And you can also raise questions directly uh, with the speakers during the Q&A after each session. So um, with no further ado, um, I hand it over to uh, Nigel Walter. So thank you very much. Yeah, hello. Hello, Nigel. Hi, sorry. Go on, guys. Um, I will take the first session. Nigel will take the second session. And uh, as Jordi very, uh, very well said, uh, feel free to uh, submit any questions you want um, uh, as we speak on the chat. And afterwards, please feel free to unmute yourselves and during the questions and answers sessions. And, you know, and let's have a very dynamic uh, uh, discussion. Um, it was our intention to, uh, to speak as little as possible so that we can have an open uh, discussion afterwards. So let us start um, here we are. Share screen. So yeah. So living religious uh, heritage from pr preservation to continuity of creation. What is living religious heritage? Uh, instead of photos, instead of theories, I decided to address this question through a diagram. I love diagrams because they help us um, visualize some uh, theoretical as well as practical aspects. Living religious heritage has to do with four elements. The first one, which is at the center, is the continuity of original function. For example, a church building continues to function as a church building. The second has to do with continuity but of course, within these functions, there are always changes. So continuity and evolution go together. Continuity does not mean that something stays without change over the course of time. So we might have, for example, um, a religious church, which over the course of, of time, for example, it might become an archaeological site, it might become a tourist attraction. So we see that function changes over the course of time, but it continues to be a religious a church. Continuity of space. Space has to do both with tangible and intangible. Over the course of time, a lot of church buildings need to adapt. For example, a religious community requires more space for its members. So they need to create a new, uh, they, they need to create new cells, new reception halls, etc. Intangible, religious practices over time evolve um, myths, uh, rituals, etc. evolve. Even during the COVID period, to give an example, a lot of rituals evolved as well. Continuity of communities care of heritage. 
there should be some community that takes care of heritage. And taking care of heritage has to do with ownership. A community that owns church buildings has to do with management. It has an established management structure. It has to do with maintenance practices. And then continuity of community's presence in heritage. There should be some community which is right there in religious heritage and can affect the evolution of religious heritage over time. Of course, we can have the case of diaspora communities, but still they need to have through indirectly, through some local community, they need to have a presence there in order to be able to define the present and the future of this religious church. So continuing with these diagrams, so what we see is that living religious heritage has to do with function, has to do with space, has to do with a community that is present in some way in the site and takes care of this site. Management of living religious heritage has to do with community groups that are associated with this religious heritage. But you see that not all community groups have the same association, the same connection with religious heritage. First of all, we can refer to a core community. The core community is the central, the religious community that originally created this heritage and continues to create this heritage, for example, a monastic community in a monastery. And then based on this criteria that we just saw, there can be different communities. This core community and the site should be seen as an inseparable part, not disconnected the one from the site. And then we can have the local community, we can have the researchers, we can have the tourists, we can have the tour agents, different community groups that are associated with the site. And each of them has a different connection with the place. So that's why you see that the arrows are not the same because we cannot say that the core community or the local community are of the same, have the same connection with tourists and tour agents. So based on the four criteria we just saw, these community groups have a different connection. So to put it very um, simply, we have a core community, a religious community living in the site and taking care of the site. Then we have several communities using the site and then we have conservation professionals protecting the site. What do we try to manage? What do we try to protect? Not the fabric per se, but we're trying to protect the community connection with heritage, this continuity. And we are trying to manage this continuity and change over time. So managing living religious heritage does not mean protecting the fabric. It means managing, helping, supporting the connection of a community with heritage. So we see that, as we said, different groups of uh, community groups with different uh, connections with heritage. So the management of religious heritage should not be seen as an equal, a process of equality. It has to do with hierarchies. We talked about the differences. We talked about, so the core community could be, in many cases, is different from the local community. A local community is a community that uh, lives near a site. In many cases, a local community might not have a strong connection with the site. The core community is the community that created the site, continues to create the site, and it has a strong connection with the site. So the core community is associated mostly to intangible elements, like function, like rituals, etc., and is supported 
by the conservation professionals and other community groups who are associated to the material elements of the site. So the emphasis is on core community, but at the same time, there is no unlimited power recognized to this core community. So we see this is a frame of support as well as control. Conservation professionals and all community groups are supporting the core community towards the continuity of creation of the site, but at the same time, they're controlling the site. So the aim is to safeguard this community connection with heritage and the protection of material should be seen as a result of this community connection of, the, of heritage. If there is no core community in a religious site, then the fabric will start having problems, no matter how hard conservation professionals are doing their job and how effectively. So the aim of the management of re religious, living religious heritage has to do with this support, supporting the continual creation of heritage. And the evolution of material is, should be seen as a result of this continual creation of heritage. And the change of material should be seen as something acceptable. And now I will refer to some specific challenges about the management of living religious heritage. What does this continual creation of heritage mean and how does this affect the surrounding landscape? I am bringing you, I'm well aware of the fact that the, you know, the majority of, 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 of us come from Europe, but I would like to draw some um, uh, parallels to non-European examples, because this would help us uh, a lot in order to um, address the challenges and understand the complexities of management religious sites, living religious sites. And why do I choose, for example, India? Because the religious traditions are very strong in this places. And the challenges, allow me to say, are even stronger than those that we face in our um, everyday life in Europe. So what is going on here? You see, this is a Hindu uh, temple. And you see on this photo, the direct connection between the temple and the city. These are shops, these are buses, these are vehicles, and they're connected to each other. How did that happen? It has to do with evolution. Because at the beginning, the temple, the Sri Ragam temple, was this surrounded by a wall. But then this continued to evolve, to expand. And at some point, you see wall structure two, wall structure three, wall structure four. At some point, the temple became a town and it was very difficult to distinguish the one from the other. So it was not just preserving a temple, it was also preserving an urban context. So we see this continuity and evolution, this expansion, continual creation of heritage over time. Different living religious heritage sites depending on their creation evolution of time, over time. We talked about the Sri Rangam temple. There are another two temples, all Hindu temples, all in India, all under the same management, etc. practices, under the same conservation, etc. Same country, same management system, etc. Tanjavur Temple is now a national and UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is a very clean surface, no interventions by locals, by religious communities. The grass is perfect, the fabric is perfect. Some rituals are allowed 
It is a living temple by the local community, but these are under strict control by the archaeological survey, the archaeological authorities of India. Sri Rangam Temple, we talked about that. There are a lot of expansions within the city, so the complexities are more. It is considered a state heritage site. And there is also a Tirumala Temple at Tirupati. This is a non designated heritage site. Why? Because the power of this religious community is so strong that this was built in the middle of nowhere and this Tirumala temple led to the creation of a whole space, a city directly associated to the temple. So we have hotels, for the, it's one of the most important pilgrimage centers in India, in Hinduism. It has hotels to accommodate the pilgrims all over India. It has restaurants to provide food. It has shops, religious shops to buy uh, for the rituals, idols, etc. So we see that the, the, this Tirumala temple is very strong because of its continual creation over time. What happened to Tanjavur and it has lost its power? What happened is that Tanjavur temple used to be originally a royal temple because there was a royal family living there and that was the center of their rituals. But at some point, this royal family moved to another place. So this temple stopped being a royal temple, and it is now a temple used by the local community. So the challenge is in Tanzavur temple, one could say this is an archaeological site primarily. And by the way, it is also used by locals for some rituals. And of course, rituals are under the control of the heritage professionals in terms of their impact on the site. Sri Rangam Temple, strong tradition, continually ex expanding, more challenges. Tirumala Temple, out of control. There is no control on the part of the heritage professionals. So we see that in every living religious site, we have to map and monitor this evolution over time to the present to see how strong or how weak this connection of the core community is with the site. Sometimes we tend to have different living heritage sites within the same site complex. How can that be? We have the case of Meteora. Meteora monasteries, six living active monasteries in the center of Greece, six different core communities. Every abbot or abbess, every head of the monastery has their own views concerning tourism, concerning heritage protection, concerning the use of space. So we have six different living heritage sites within the same context. Two of the monastic of the mon monasteries are very open to tourism. So they would be very active in terms of promotion, in terms of branding, in terms of um, uh, uh, participating in uh, religious uh, conferences, etc., in order to promote tourism. The arrangement of space internally is mostly addressing tourists. There are museum shops addressing tourists. There are museums, museum galleries addressing tourists. Other two monasteries of the six are very much into ascetism. We are here in order to, we monastic communities are here in order to conduct our religious and monastic life. This means Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, monastery is closed. 
because the monastery is for us. Okay, we would leave it open for some visitors, tourists, twice per week. Different perception towards tourism, different perception towards monasticism. And the other two are somewhere in the middle. So it is very important when we have a complex site with different religious, smaller subsites to see, to focus on this evolution of time over time, to focus on management maintenance practices in each different specific site. It's not the same. Leaving heritage sites within dead archaeological sites, it becomes even more complicated. This is an example of an UNESCO, another UNESCO World Heritage Site in Greece, Mistras. As we see, it is a place, this is a living monastery. There is a monastic community there, but all these are ruins. How did that, how did we end up with this reality? This used to be a city, castle city. A city surrounded by castle over medieval times, over uh, Ottoman times, etc. At some point, the city fell into enemies, etc. So this Byzantine Greek medieval city fell. People had to leave. At some point, there was a new capital, a new city emerged. So even the remaining local community had to leave the place and go to this, settle in this capital city. So we end up having, at some point, the heritage authorities of Greece fenced off this place, declared it a national and then an UNESCO World Heritage Site. So there is nobody living inside the place. So it's a dead archaeological site, like all the dead archaeological, all the archaeological sites we know today. But there is a monastic community. This, you see this church here, is this church here. There is a monastic community living in the center of the site. So it's a living site within a dead archaeological site. The primary function of this place is an archaeological site. The primary role in the management is in the hands of the archaeological authorities of Greece. So what happens is that all the rest is an archaeological site and this corridor, it has a door from here and, and another door the other way, is for the use of the monastic community. The opening hours of the site are defined by the archaeological site of the archaeological authorities, eight to eight so that visitors, tourists are encouraged to come. This religious community, this monastic community lives here and they conduct the religious, the rituals here. But the rituals, when do they conduct them? Outside the visiting hours of the archeological site. If this religious, if this monastic community needs more space, they cannot have the space because the rules are set by the archaeological authorities. They're living in an archaeological site, so they cannot expand. If they want to make changes to this fabric here, building new refectories, building new toilets, it's not possible because this is a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we see the complexities of a living religious heritage site within a broader archaeological site. And now we have these core communities moving against local communities and heritage authorities. This kind of balance of power regarding the, the living, the creation of living heritage. Going back to Meteora, at some point, 1980, James Bond, uh, 
the movie industry wanted to film, to shoot a film for your eyes only um, with Roger Moore at Meteora. That was, authorities in Greece were very happy. Local community was very happy with that because at that point, James Bond was a huge thing. And at that point, all the Greek state, the local community needed to bring tourists in the site. So this, the shooting of a James Bond movie was a great gift given offered to them because this would make the, the Meteora famous all over the world. They welcomed the shooting of the film. The monastic community said no, because the principles of James Bond are very different, even in conflict with our principles. This is what the monks and the nuns said. And you know what they did? They, you see, this is a, this is a monastery of Meteora. They put flags there, a Greek flag and a Byzantine flag in order to demonstrate that this is, this place is a Greek place, it's a religious place, etc. And in order not to allow even the shooting, the use of the image of their monastery by the company. So what else they did, they closed the monastery. So you have a whole tourism industry, global tourism industry, national, local, bringing tourists to Meteora, and they sat the monasteries. And they explain, these are tourists, as you see, European or American tourists from the Western world. And you see, they write, the monastic communities write that this, we keep intentionally, the monastic communities closed because we demonstrate against, protest against the shooting of, etc., etc. So they shut the monasteries. And you see the James Bond film company had to make some replicas. And you see poor Roger Moore with his uh, partner in the film, you know, shooting the film there. Local communities and heritage authorities controlling their core community in this creation continual creation of living heritage site. At some point back in 1930s, some of the monks in one of the monasteries of Meteora were seducing girls from the local village. The local community threatened to burn down the monastery. You are not here to seduce our girls. You are here to conduct your religious rituals and your monastic life. So we see that this system of control operates and should operate. Sometimes heritage authorities and local communities losing the control. This is an UNESCO, Meteora UNESCO World Heritage Site where construction or further construction is Illegal. It's in the core of UNESCO World Heritage Site. Monastic community complained they had no sufficient space. They started building a new monastery. In the core of an UNESCO World Heritage Site, they built a five story building. They built another. Number two, they built another two story building behind number four, and then they built a lift to connect the two buildings with the original building. The lift is number three, the original building is number one. Control is lost. This is not a good example of managing living religious 
heritage because this system of support as well as control lost any kind, heritage authorities and local community lost any kind of control over the management of the site. As I said, managing a living religious site does not mean giving all the power to this monastic or religious community to construct and do whatever they want. Construct buildings, seduce girls, etc. No. And the last, balancing religious function and tourism. You see? Tourism shops just outside the Meteora. This is the space, private space for the monks. This is the space of tourists. What is going on here? The monks need more space to conduct the religious ceremonies so they continue build things within their private space. This is the entrance for the tourists. This is the entrance for the monks. So you see this, the same space has been disconnected for the religious community and for the visitors. This is not a good example again. So in order to conclude the key challenges in terms of the management of living religious heritage has to do with safeguarding community connection, community's connection with heritage, balancing continuity and at the same evolution. Emphasizing core community and at the same time embracing other community groups. These other community groups and the heritage authorities support, but at the same time control the continual creation of heritage. And the third key challenge is how to embrace tourism within the religious function of the place. This is the book. It is open access. Feel free to, uh, to make use of that. These are some references from the non-Western world but also from Meteora. And uh, most of this is open access. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please address them now. Many thanks, uh, Johannes, for this, uh, sharing such thought-provoking examples and reflections. Uh, I found it particularly interesting this this concept of the core community linked to the functions and rituals and the support of other community groups that are linked more to the material elements of the site. And uh, of course, these these challenges of, of the continual creation of heritage over time and how to balance the continuity with the evolution. Very interesting. Um, so uh, for all participants, uh, feel free to raise any questions on this first session. Uh, I see there's a hand raised of Samida. Go ahead, Samida. Yeah. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And actually, I have read your book as well as all the things that you have published, and they have helped me immensely. Uh, my question is, uh, you showed an example of uh, Indian case study in the southern part of India. So knowing both European and Indian framework, uh, what would you say is the main difference of how they handle the conservation in terms of controlling the conservation strategy? And how do you think uh, one can learn from the other side? Like how Indian framework can learn from European and how European can learn from Indian? Hmm. Very interesting example, very interesting question, a very difficult question. I think that the problem we have in, uh, sorry to use the term problem, but I see that the issue, I would say it's a problem. In the Western world, in Europe, is that um, religious connections are going down. We increasingly uh, live in uh, secular societies, and um, which means that uh, communities are less interested in... Uh, their uh, religious uh, heritage. Uh, another issue is that in many, uh, that's why, for example, we have a lot of churches being converted into cafes and restaurants. I do not say it's bad, but since people are not do not believe, what are you mm -hmm. going to do with these churches? And uh, it's a big issue, but 
having empty churches uh, while nobody follows this religion, what is the point? The other issue is that in many countries, um, including Greece, um, religious authorities are not officially involved in the management of uh, religious heritage. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Nigel will present a different example to this. So we look forward to this example of Nigel. But in many countries, religious authorities are not involved, officially involved in the management of the spaces. And this creates, creates a dichotomy. You have um, these sites as heritage sites, they belong, they're owned and managed by the archaeological authorities, the heritage authorities of the countries. While as uh, uh, buildings, as religious sites, they're owned and managed by the religious communities. But there is no way that these two powers come, are co cooperate with each other. So there is a problem in the management, there is a problem in the legislation yeah. at the very beginning. I would say it, there is an inefficient way of managing living religious heritage places from the very, very beginning. Mm. These are the thoughts and also conservation is based mostly on dead places. They do not they cannot in Europe fully embrace the, um, uh, the living character of cities, of um, uh, religious buildings, etc. These are the key issues in Europe. The key issues in other places is that, including India, is that religious connections are so strong that material, the material is sometimes heavily affected, heavily compromised by the religious, uh, the, the evolving, the expanding religious traditions. And sometimes in the um, non-Western world, it is very difficult to understand this connection between tangible and intangible that because tangible bears intangible elements. If you destroy the tangible, intangible elements are also affected. So it is very different, difficult for this part of the world to understand that, yes, it's a religious building, it should maintain, of course there should be changes, etc., but it should maintain as a religious uh, building. The other issue in uh, the non-Western world is this, how could I say, reluctance mm -hmm. um, to deal with anything that is old. If my house becomes older, I would like to destroy it and build a new house. Mm. If my habits become old, I would like to replace them with new habits. In this context, it is very difficult for um, um, uh, local communities in Asia and in Africa to understand that the old has some significance in it. Mm. So I think that merging the two would benefit both. And especially would benefit, I think, the, the Asian and African communities in order to understand that another issue, the problem we have in both contexts, both European and Western and non-Western, is that heritage authorities think that they are the exclusive experts in managing. This has to do with the training. This has to do with all these doctrines that we have, uh, um, as conservation professionals, we have uh, uh, accepted, etc. We are not the experts. We are here to support as well as control the religious communities. We do not try to preserve 
the material. We try to help towards the continual creation of space. Mm. This is something that heritage experts from both sides, because a lot of experts, a lot of authorities, mm. professionals in, in, in India and other places have been trained in Western universities, etc. So it is very important to understand the, um, that what is the role in this process. And the last issue of India, as well as Asian countries and also African countries, they, sometimes they do not feel proud of their own heritage and also of their own expertise. Mm -hmm. They try to focus on UNESCO, ICOMOS, etc. Oh, this is fine, but they, they, they should be confident of their traditional management practices, of their traditional um, maintenance practices. Sometimes they try to replace these practices through modern ones. This yeah. is not the key uh, path to success. These are the issues that I would very briefly outline, Samida. Yeah, actually, I agree with your last point a lot because the Indian framework is uh, loosely based on the Western framework because of the colonial uh, colonial um, frameworks that uh, took place before. Uh, there is one small question that I have. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you mentioned that um, there is a need to map the evolution as well. So if let's say uh, there is a religious heritage site, which is a living one, and they have their own traditions of uh, maintaining the site or even taking uh, care of the material itself, then how do you think as experts we would contribute towards mapping this? Like, would it be an expert-based pro uh, process? Would it be like a, a project where the community is involved or would it be uh, community-based, but then experts would just be there as a consultant? Who starts the process is irrelevant to me. The essence is the most important thing. The essence is that the, the, the communities should map the site, all the conservation professionals should map the site in collaboration with the religious communities. If they do not do that, then the most important intangible elements of the site will be gone. Heritage professionals will not be able to understand them. And also mapping the site is very important because especially in the, in the world of the last decades, because of COVID, because of sometimes of wars, we have the Russia, uh, Ukraine war going on. Um, sometimes religious communities leave their yeah. sites. In these cases of discontinuity of presence, of physical presence, it is very important to remember what was going on before the departure. Mm. Because even in the case of uh, monastic communities, just to give you an example, um, because of wars, uh, World War II, et cetera, uh, civil war after World War II, there was an absence of community presence. When heritage authorities and monastic communities got back, then they tried to restore the place without having lived in the place. Mm. There were mistakes out of that. For example, they would see a wall. This part of the wall was much lighter than this part of the wall. This was much uh, heavier. They could not understand the difference. So they made this same thick with this. Yes, but this wall was exposed to winds while this was not exposed to winds. So the living community who would be living in this place with no discontinuity of presence would say, you know, we have winds on this mm. land. So what they eventually did, they thought it was a kind of mistake, construction mistake. They made them same thickness, but this started to fall apart because there was no commu community saying, you know, bearing mm. this and this and this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samida. Thanks. Um, so we just have a couple more minutes before the second session. I see there's two hands raised. So maybe first, uh, Anthony Bratanov. Hey, hello, everyone. Hello, Anthony. 
Yeah, Ioannis, uh, thank you for very good thoughts. I especially liked the part of understanding like the past and all the needs of stakeholders in this process. So my question, like Europe has a great experience in combining preserving heritage and uh, technology. Yes. From your point of view, like what is the percent like of this trend is going on in Europe? Can I can I explain like my question? Yes, of course, Anthony. Like we have uh, traditional preservation, and we have uh, preservation what consists uh, consists like, the part of technological. So, can you give like a percent like a percentage? Yeah, a percentage out of different projects. You know. Thank you. Uh, I would talk about energy efficiency issues. Um, sometimes in, um, in Europe, we tend to uh, use modern facilities that are you know, more energy efficient, etc., which yet have to be replaced every you know, couple of decades, etc. While we should start with the traditional energy efficiency practices. For example, a religious building uh, of 500 years, they also had bad weather conditions. They also had, uh, uh, you know, snowfalls. They also had um, uh, heat waves. How did they manage to deal with this? So one should start from these. And then, whenever there would be an issue, try then to embrace new facilities, new technologies after taking of benefit of that. I would never give a percentage, but believe me, traditional practices should be certainly more than 50%. I would even say, sorry, Anthony, because you, you asked me to give a percentage. That's why I'm asking, I'm, I'm giving a percentage. It would be 65% and 35%. 65 to traditional, 35 to non-traditional, to modern ones. And I think this would be a shocking to you. 60 to 65, 35 to 40, maximum 40, not more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Many thanks. And now uh, we can quickly take uh, the uh, last question. Um, I see Lillian, you have your hand raised. Well, I have my... Oh hand raised because first I want to thank Johannes uh, for a very uh, well done presentation. It opened my eyes, even though being working in the field of religious heritage already for, I don't know, 15 or 16 years, uh, the comparison and the, um, the main message, at least what I took, and, I, and uh, this is my question to you, is this really the main message is first make sure to build your knowledge of the past together with the community and the heritage experts, they need to appreciate one another and because in only this way, the knowledge of the past might, might be helpful to build a, a sustainable future. Is this the main message uh, that I can take from this session? Because from the, uh, from the examples you gave in India, very, very interesting. Uh, I'm in the Netherlands and um, uh, we, we have a small space in the Netherlands. We have a lot of inhabitants. And so, yes, in the past, a lot of heritage was destroyed, also religious heritage. But after the research and uh, the three years, the, the past three years, we came to the overall conclusion that it might be even better to have extended use or in order to support the, the core communities to maintain the building or to be able to stay in the building. Because if people do not understand at all what is happening there or what has happened there, uh, um, there will be strange new purposes for the buildings. And in the end, this might be the end of the building, maybe not within 10 years, but maybe in 20, 25 years. Very valid point. Uh, I just shared with you an uh, image, but uh, allow me to. Uh, there is a planning process methodology. It is in the book. 
You identify the site based on these criteria, et cetera, and then you establish collaboration with the core community. What you just said, aims and expectations of conservation process shared by the heritage professionals and the core community. And how do you establish that? Sometimes with a mediator, a mediator could help. And then you map the living heritage site with the community concerns at present. What are the needs? Evolution of continuity over time to present. Traditional management systems, going back to the previous questions as well. So the conservation process is linked from the very beginning to the sustainable development of the core community. And the modern conservation-based systems are linked, Anthony, to the traditional systems. So you see, during the mapping, you do that. And then you assess the living, you see, the living heritage site together. So the point that you raised was very important about how to establish collaboration with the core community and how to the map the living heritage site with the core community, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, should we proceed and if there is any question to bring it at the end? Yeah. Yes, please. So I saw there was a question by, uh... Cristina Gutierrez. So maybe if uh, she doesn't mind uh, to ask after the second session, so Could we can we keep that? on time. So now I invite uh, Nigel Walter to take the floor. Many thanks, Johannes, for your presentation. Okay, can you see that? Is that, is yes. that uh, perfect? perfect. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you very much to um, FRH for, for the opportunity to, to talk to you. It's, um, both Juanes and I are delighted to be uh, to be here. Um, so, uh, just to give you an indication of um, how this uh, part of the session will be uh, structured, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about um, where I'm coming from into this discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about the ecclesiastical exemption, which uh, is a process in England uh, by which churches, most churches, historic churches, are, um, are permission to change them uh, is dealt with. Um, I'm going to talk about how conservation uh, deals with living buildings or uh, doesn't. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the theoretical foundations for the approach that uh, I would favour, which uh, I've termed a narrative approach. Look at the issue of application uh, and then some brief comments on sustainability and then some concluding principles. So that's the shape of the, uh, of the thing overall. So in terms of, uh, in terms of context, um, uh, I'm a specialist conservation architect. Uh, I uh, work in the UK, um, England um, entirely, in fact. Um, and this church is one of the churches that I'm responsible for. Um, it's just a few miles to the east of Cambridge. Um, and this is uh, a medieval building in, in, in origin. You know, most of what you can see is medieval. The, the um, projecting part uh, uh, on, th this is the north side of the building. Um, that north transept is brick, so it's a, it's a later rebuilding, um, but it's a medieval building. However, it's changed a lot during its history. So for example, um, the building, instead of having a west tower, it used to have a tower in the middle of the building over the crossing. Um, so uh, it's, it's a building that has undergone all sorts of change through its history. And you can see some of the um, indications that you can see blocked up doorways, etc. It's also this, um, in England, we have um, three grades of statutory protection, um, grade two at the bottom, grade two star, and then grade one at the top. This uh, church is a grade two star building. And uh, we changed this building a few years ago, um, taking out uh, some pews at the rear, um, putting in um, a kitchen and uh, toilet, um, which you can see under uh, at uh, ground level there. And because uh, in, a, in a tower, usually there are bells in the tower, uh, which are rung, um, and uh, you there therefore need somewhere for the uh, bell ringers to um, pull the ropes, which you can see just suspended at the top. And uh, so uh, having put those facilities in the bottom of the tower, we then need to create a um, a gallery which the bell ringers use for um, for ringing the bells, but also you can, I mean, the, the building as you see it is in sort of party mode as it were, 
Um, and uh, it, it enables a whole load, the changes that we've uh, introduced here, enable a whole load of um, more community sort of activities to take place within the building. And um, bringing those community uses back into um, church buildings, um, in my, uh, the way I look at that is, is a reintroduction of um, the medieval understanding of the church as the hub of the community. Now, in medieval times, of course, the whole culture was meaningfully Christian, um, but all sorts of things used to happen within these buildings that, um, for example, to a 19th century mindset uh, were really quite surprising. Um, and uh, we, we, we are having gone to one extreme with that, these buildings, we are coming back a little way towards uh, an earlier model. At least that's the way I conceive of it. And that has implications for the role of community um, in, in what are still um, living buildings. So um, to give you a little bit of context uh, in terms of numbers, um, in England, there are something like 400,000 listed buildings, protected buildings. The Church of England specifically has about 16,000, nobody knows exactly how many, um, may surprise you, um, but uh, approximately 16,000 church buildings. And if you uh, look at those very roughly, a quarter of them are not protected, they're modern buildings or not, you know, really not of much uh, interest from a conservation point of view. And then um, a quarter are grade two and a quarter are grade two star and a quarter are grade one. So um, there's uh, roughly speaking a quarter in each category and roughly speaking half of the 16,000 are medieval in the sense that they have at least you know, some features remaining from the original medieval building that was on the site. Um, and then if you look at it from the other point of view of the grade one, the highest grade of uh, buildings of all grade one protected buildings within um, England, um, almost half of them are churches. So um, the, and that's because um, a lot of these buildings are medieval and they, they um, were, were put in the, in the highest bracket. So um, church buildings represent a very important part of uh, the heritage of England. Um, and the, within England, um, if you have a, a, a listed a protected um, house, say, you uh, obtain your permission to do any change to it from the local authority. It's a secular process. But uh, from the outset, pretty much, uh, there has been a parallel process for permission uh, for changes to still used church buildings. Um, and it's termed the ecclesiastical exemption and its exemption from uh, listed building consent in the secular system. And um, the, there are six denominations that, are, um, uh, that qualify for that ecclesiastical exemption. And the one with by far the most buildings is the Church of England um, and the, with most of the um, highest uh, listed ones. So I, I will be talking to you a little bit about uh, the Church of England system within that overall category of e ecclesiastical exemption. First thing, though, I would point out is that um, the uh, the ecclesiastical exemption is um, a huge statement of sorry, I've gone I've gone on too far there. Um, it's it's a huge statement of um, the importance of living heritage um, because it recognizes that the secular system can't deal adequately with um, buildings that are in church use. So so this is an example of. Um, a different situation, as uh, Iwanis um, was uh, sort of giving me a little trail to, to the situations that he was describing. Um, so uh, within the um, within the um, Church of England system, um, there's a core body uh, uh, called a diocesan advisory committee. Each diocese in the church, there are about 42, I think, has uh, has to have one of these uh, diocesan advisory committees, which act as a funnel and a filter and a resource for um, trying to help churches to improve their applications for permission. The actual permission is called a faculty. Um, and the process involves consultation with the same people who all of the same bodies that would be consulted under the listed building um, system. And, and the key thing is that the, um, the church system has to have, the, the legislation under which it operates requires it to have an equivalent system. Uh, so uh, an, a system of equivalent rigor. Um, so it can be more rigorous if it wants to be, 
Uh, and in some respects, it is more rigorous, uh, which I'll touch on if, if anybody is uh, interested in that at the end. OK, so um, turning to the ecclesiastical exemption, um, and as I say, within the Church of England, that's called um, the faculty. So the person, there is one person only who actually makes the decision about uh, permission, and that uh, person is termed the chancellor. And the chancellor is a judge or, um, or a barrister, um, a specialist in ecclesiastical law. And uh, the diocesan advisory committee and everybody else in the process is simply advising this person, the chancellor, who makes the decision. Um, the second aspect, which is great for a researcher like myself, is that um, because these are lawyers, they write judgments. So uh, they, they write down their uh, decision and they write down the reasoning behind their decision. So um, a and that happens every time. And um, these judgments, they might be half a dozen pages or a dozen pages is common. Sometimes if it's a complicated case, it'll be 50 or 60 pages. And it's, a, it's fascinating to see the way the thing is argued through. And that's, um, it's absolutely gold dust uh, in terms of research. It's fantastic. There are some particularly uh, interesting cases. Uh, the one I would highlight uh, is the one at St. Alkmund Duffield. Um, and uh, that's an appeal case. So there's a, um, uh, the chancellor may make their decision, but then if uh, anybody doesn't like that decision, uh, they can appeal to a higher court. Um, and that was, uh, Duffield was a, um, an appeal decision. And the Duffield judgment set out a process, a framework for, uh, or it clarified a framework, which I will uh, talk to you about in, in just a minute. Uh, that link at the bottom is, uh, you can find these judgments, they're published, so uh, you can go and uh, sort of enjoy uh, finding those. The key thing about this process, as, as I say, is that this is a recognition of living heritage. Um, it's a recognition that the secular system can't deal with uh, this stuff in the same way. This is the Church of St. Altmund in Duffield, uh, uh, where this decision was uh, that this related to. And the process that bears its name um, is a five step process. And this is the process that all chancellors are, are meant to follow. So the first step in the process is to decide whether or not the, the proposal, proposals would harm the significance of the church. And the significance is defined in relatively narrow terms, architectural and historic interest. Um, so there's a discussion about you know, the value system, whether or not that's a full account of significance, et cetera, that's not dealt with. Um, if the answer to that question is no, then the um, church will get their permission and there's you know, nothing more of interest. It gets interesting if, if the answer to the first question is yes, which is the case in almost every case. And then two questions are asked. Um, first of those two is how serious would the harm be? And the second is what would the benefit of the changes be and how clear and convincing is the justification for that benefit? And those two questions require uh, the church to prepare two documents, two statements. The first statement is called the Statement of Significance, which deals with the why the building is important in the first place and therefore what would be harmed by the, um, or what would be impacted by the proposals. And the second is a Statement of Needs, which sets out the um, thinking behind why the thing is needed in the first place. And then the fifth stage is the key thing, which is to balance those uh, uh, two items, three and four. And the question there is, does, do the public benefits outweigh the harm? Um, and uh, if the answer to that is yes, then the faculty is granted. If the answer is no, then the faculty is not granted. It's very simple. So there's a balancing and that balancing is, uh, again, reflects the secular system, which is also a question of balancing. And if you're interested in, the, um, uh, in that particular case, that's the link for that. So um, that's the way uh, the system works. Now, within the conservation landscape, as we're all aware, there, all aware, there are loads of experts. And this is a slide that's taken from a presentation that I, I do with churches, uh, so with no ex, uh, experience of the conservation landscape. And the first thing I tell them is that the DAC, the Diocesan Advisory Committee, is their friend and should be their first port of call because they can get a whole load of help from them. And they're much more likely to succeed with their applications if they work uh, collaboratively with the DAC than if they uh, try and fight against them. And the DAC combines, it combines architects um, and uh, various other heritage experts, specialists in particular aspects of church architecture and furnishings. Uh, it also includes church people. So it gets 
some of the uh, some of the um, if you like the sort of communal value the, um, and perhaps social value um, into the discussion. So it's more than just a focus on the fabric, uh, which is uh, important. But beyond the DAC, there are all sorts of other people who also have a say in what uh, what happens. There are six amenity societies, um, which are non-governmental, if you like, special interest groups. And four of those are based on period. So we have the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, uh, which deals with everything up to 1700, the Georgian group up to uh, 1837, Victorian society up to 1914, and then the 20th century society. So if a church building has multiple um, bits, and they normally do, then you may well have um, two, three, possibly even all four of those uh, bodies wishing to comment. There are then a couple of other amenity societies which are not period based, and then a couple of other bodies um, which uh, have a different role. Um, historic England is um, the government's statutory advisor on um, the historic environment. Um, and then there's the Church Buildings Council, which is an, uh, an overall body. I, I sit on the Church Buildings Council and um, just like a, a DAC, we do casework, but we also do policy work. So we help set policy for the Church of England with respect to its buildings. The system is governed by um, what's called the Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction and Care of Churches Measure 2018. Um, a measure is like an act of parliament, but for, uh, for the church system. Um, and the guidance there, or the, the, the legislation there, starts with, it's in, the whole thing is framed with this general duty to have uh, regard to the church's purpose. And basically it says that anybody involved with conservation under this measure must have due regard to the role of a church as a local center of worship and mission. So that's a great example, again, of the recognition of living heritage because um, being a local center of worship and mission is all about the life of the church um, through the um, physical fabric of the church because uh, they're obviously using the building for those purposes. And the, and the other key thing is that um, I would say, I, I, I would encourage church communities to own their expertise because church communities are often um, sort of uh, just sort of awed and confused and sort of dazzled like a rabbit in the headlights by all these experts saying expert things. And it's really important for the health of the, uh, of the heritage that they own their own expertise, which is, uh, should be uh, their expertise in understanding their community. Um, uh, and that, I would say, is indispensable for the future uh, health of the church building. So um, that's the way the system works. I'll just show you an example. This is not uh, one of my projects, but uh, by another um, architectural practice called uh, Freeland Reese Roberts, very, uh, very experienced, very good practice, uh, also working in the, in the same sort of area. This is a building uh, called Wyndham Abbey, uh, which is now a parish church, but was a much larger uh, monastic uh, um, sort of settlement. Uh, you can see some ruins uh, down here. So there was a whole lot more here. And the building has two towers because this, this part of the building was the parish church. And then here there was another whole church used by the, uh, used by the monastic community. So there were two churches on the one side. It, um, all our monasteries got uh, dissolved. Um, taken over effectively uh, but, um, in the 1530s uh, by King Henry VIII. So um, in this case, they demolished a whole load of stuff out, out here, the monastic stuff, and left uh, the parish stuff. So it's a building with a really interesting uh, history. Here's the interior. Um, there's all sorts of things that have happened to this building. Um, you, know, you, can, you can see the sort of early Gothic Romanesque stuff, but um, the Rarados at the end is 20th century by this um, architect, uh, Ninian Comper. That's what it was like before he, uh, he intervened. So it's another building with a whole load of uh, change that has happened to it, both additional and subtractive change. And here's the, um, it's always interesting to find the sort of archeological plan um, that shows the different stages, uh, in this case from um, 1107, the way the building has um, expanded and contracted over time, uh, according to changes of needs or you know, politics, et cetera. That's how the building stood in 1847. Um, and uh, that's how the building stood in 2015 um, during the, uh, implementation of a series of changes that uh, Freeland and Ruth Roberts uh, brought. So there are two extensions, the major one to the south here and a smaller one um, to the north here. Um, and that's after it was completed. 
Um, and there are those two extensions, this one sort of occupying a, a, a ruined chapel um, with a new building. And that's, that's uh, this building looking the other way. So it's an example of the sort of change that can happen to um, a building within, and this is a grade one listed building and also a scheduled monument, uh, which is a, a protection for buildings that are no longer used. So all the stuff out here is a scheduled monument. So it's an example of um, being able to do quite um, significant change in a modern idiom um, within um, a historical context. I want to go on and um, talk about the way conservation, as I see it, the way conservation relates or doesn't relate uh, to um, living buildings. Um, this is St. Petersburg uh, or Leningrad as it was in Soviet times. Um, and uh, the, um, the author uh, E.F. Schumacher, who died in the, in the late 70s, um, there was a book that he published, um, in fact, it was published posthumously called A Guide for the Perplexed, published in 1978. And he starts that book uh, with this uh, rather charming anecdote. On a visit to Leningrad some years ago, I consulted a map to find out where I was, but I could not make it out. I could see enormous, several enormous churches, yet there was no trace of them on my map. When finally an interpreter came to help me, he said, um, we don't show our churches on our maps. Contradicting him, I pointed to one that was very clearly marked. This is a museum, he said, not what we call a living church. It is only the living churches that we don't show. That seems to me to be a fantastic, uh, the, 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 the sort of double negative in there, only the living churches that we don't show, seems to me to stand uh, for something uh, uh, about the invisibility of living heritage within conservation. Uh, conservation does not do a good job of understanding living heritage. Um, so how conservation deals with change. This is a quote from Gustavo Arroz um, while he was president of ICOMOS. During the 19th and most of the 20th century, the heritage conservation community developed under the assumption that all values attributed places rested on the material evidence of the place. Thus, the theory and practice of conservation evolved as an increasingly sophisticated effort to prevent form and space from undergoing change. That's really important. The conservation, deep down, a lot of conservation, at least in my experience, I hope that other people have different experience, but at least in my experience, um, deep down, there's a sort of gut feeling that things shouldn't change. Uh, he talks about the 19th century, obviously conservation is a modern thing really, or modern conservation is a, is a modern thing starting uh, in the 19th century. This is um, the uh, poet and playwright, uh, Thomas Hardy. And he was uh, very much involved with SPAB, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And had this, uh, he presented an essay to them uh, in uh, a meeting in 1906, in which he says, to the incumbent, so the vicar, the, the, the priest, the church is a workshop, to the antiquary, it's a relic, to the parish, it's a utility, to the outsider, a luxury, how to unite these incompatibles. So that's a quote about different people having completely um, incompatible claims over the same building. So people coming at it from a, quite different points of view. And while we, you might change some of the vocabulary in that, it still very much marks the way churches are, are dealt with now. So behind that, there's, there's uh, an interesting sort of question about sort of how stuff matters and who gets a voice in, in, in terms of um, you know, determining the future of this heritage. He also goes on in the same essay uh, just shortly after to say, if the ruinous church could be enclosed in a crystal palace and a new church be built alongside for services, the method would be an ideal one. So he's talking about decanting the religious life of the building into a separate building so that the church doesn't have to be compromised. The church, the ancient church can stay the way it is and the community can get on with their religious business elsewhere. And of course, I would say that that is absolutely disastrous. It's toxic because it denies the connection between the ongoing activity and the physical fabric of the building. That, that's, what it, that's what living heritage is. Um, there's uh, on, on a, a different view, um, happily, uh, Historic England um, uh, in their specific guidance about churches, they, they start with this statement that they believe that this country's historic places should retain their role as living buildings 
at the heart of their communities. They don't then go on and unpack what they mean by living buildings, but uh, it's a very important uh, framing comment. And Historic England, um, behind that, there's um, a, uh, an understanding in Historic England, uh, which is central to their um, conservation principles document, which is, is a very important document, um, which talk, defines conservation as the management of change. Now, that's, um, that's a definition that comes from um, Sir Bernard Fielden in the mid 80s, um, and it has grown in importance and arguably changed somewhat in, in its application, but uh, that's central. And then thinking about change, um, uh, you know, so uh, the, the management of change is, is sort of accepting that change will happen. Um, there's a quote from the 19th century theologian in a different context, in the context of um, the, the development of the early church, but um, that uh, says this, in a higher world it is otherwise, but here below is to live is to change. Now that's a similar acceptance that change happens. Then he goes on, and to be perfect is to have changed often. So that's saying that we should be rejoicing in change. And that is, a, I suggest, a much more appropriate framework for, or, or gut feeling, if you like, for um, when one comes to dealing with living heritage, because if there is change happening, it means that the heritage is alive. Now, that doesn't mean that any change is good change, but um, it, it's a challenging uh, sort of um, uh, view um, for, conservation to uh, get their head around. So um, moving on um, to the narrative approach. Now, um, if I had to choose a book uh, to represent conservation, I think I would choose uh, this novel uh, by uh, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations. One of the characters in, in the story is Miss Havisham, um, who's a spinster um, for whom time has stopped. Uh, and time stopped at the moment that she was abandoned at the altar. And uh, she continues to live in her wedding dress many years after the uh, wedding cake is in her room and the, the mice have hollowed it out and they're running around it. Um, and she has this protege called uh, Estella. And Estella has a line in the book which appears on the front cover of this uh, particular uh, video of it, which is, uh, we are who we are, people don't change. Um, now, I would disagree with that uh, statement, um, but it's uh, a, a, a sort of really good summary for, uh, for something. Compare that uh, with this quote from Winston Churchill, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. So that's a quite different understanding um, to, uh, for example, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of basic sort of historic understanding within um, conservation that uh, Thomas Hardy was articulating. Um, that's uh, uh, something that talks about relationship between people and place. It's uh, also, a, a, in some sense, an intimate relationship. It, it's, it's a little bit like a dance um, where um, if, if either party it drags their feet, then you're both going to fall over. Um, talking of dance, um, there's uh, an interesting quote from Hilary Mantel, the, the historic novelist. Um, History, she says, is not the past. It is the method we have evolved of organizing our ignorance of the past. It's the plan of the positions taken when we stop the dance to note them down. It's what's left in the sieve when the centuries have run through it. It's no more the past than a birth certificate is a birth or a script is a performance or a map is a journey. I, I love those pairings of the form and the life. And uh, I think there is something that um, conservation can, can learn from that. Indeed, I believe that conservation can only deal with change and therefore with living heritage if it sees historic buildings in terms of narrative. So the metaphor is this, imagine a historic building as an unfinished novel that's perhaps got to as far as eight chapters and our task in the present is to write the ninth. Now, if that's the situation, then we need to do a number of things. We need to fully understand the story to date. So um, that goes to the question uh, earlier on about history. Uh, we need to be creative in the current generation and we need to leave plot lines open for those who we know who will follow, who will have different questions to ask and different uh, ways in which they want to take uh, the narrative. And so we need to understand past change, we need to embrace current change, and we need to anticipate future change. So I would say that um, 
uh, narrative approach transforms buildings from being um, inert uh, and a, a backdrop to human action to themselves having agency, so being a character in, in the dramatic production that is culture. And if we're not going to carry on producing culture, then what are we doing? Um, that would be the question. So what about the theoretical foundations um, uh, undergirding uh, that approach? Um, firstly, I suppose starting with um, a sort of cautionary note, um, this, is, uh, this is a picture of a classic sort of conservation uh, dilemma or situation. Um, every conservation student uh, gets introduced to it, at least if they're gonna deal with masonry. Um, where hard modern cement has directly caused the damage that we see to uh, the softer brick. Um, I suggest that we can also think of this metaphorically as the, um, uh, the bricks being the buildings that we uh, are looking after and the mortar between them being the theory that we employ. And if the theory is too hard, the theory is absolutely essential to the stability of the wall, but if the theory is too hard, it will destroy uh, the building. So theory is essential, but theory also has the capacity, if we choose the wrong theory, um, to destroy the thing we're um, trying to keep, uh, trying to take care of. So um, there's uh, a cautionary warning there. So with the narrative approach, the, the narrative approach, I suppose, starts by acknowledging that modernity is a rupture. Modernity is based on an understanding of a discontinuity with history. And because modern conservation is thoroughly part of modernity, um, it is based on that discontinuity thinking, which is quite in contrast to um, what uh, Juanis was outlining earlier. This quote from the anthropologist uh, and philosopher Bruno Latour, um, as Nietzsche observed long ago, the moderns suffer from the illness of historicism. They want to keep everything, date everything, because they think they have definitively broken with their past. The more they accumulate revolutions, the more they save, the more they capitalize, the more they put on display in museums. Maniacal destruction is counterbalanced by an equally maniacal conservation. So the response to uh, that situation, which I think is, is well sketched by Latour, yeah, has three elements. Firstly, um, continuity, um, and the continuity is uh, brings up the question of what it is that we're conserving, and uh, we'll, I'll come along at the end with the principles to talking about the nexus of, of people and place. Um, it highlights the role of uh, people, and indeed, um, as well as the people in the community, it also um, changes potentially the role of the expert. Um, to become one of the enabler or interpreter or possibly narrator. Um, one is, has talked about the fourfold con continuity, uh, which I've got down here is use, community, culture and care. Uh, and there are some of uh, the references. The second element is tradition, because we can't deal with the objects of tradition um, using only the tools of modernity. Um, tradition is not about a lack of creativity, but it's about a bounded creativity, which I think fits very well with the aims of conservation. Uh, and one of the key sources there is um, Alistair McIntyre, um, his 1985 book, After Virtue, um, which talks about um, practices uh, being located within communal narratives and on the basis of uh, shared tradition. And so to narrative, um, narrative is all about, what appeals to me about narrative with respect to this situation where we're trying to deal with living buildings? is that it uh, represents temporal continuity, so continuity of time, and gathering both past, present, and future within what you could term a thick present. Um, that's a term from uh, Paul Ricoeur uh, at the bottom, um, a series of books um, called Time and Narrative. Um, it sees a building as a developing personality rather than a completed biography, um, and it's fundamentally communal, not uh, individual. Um, and it works partly because everybody gets narrative, everybody, and when, when you start talking to uh, people without conservation training about their building as a story, they get it because everybody loves, uh, loves a good story. Here's a picture of a storyteller outside the uh, uh, Citadel in Cairo. Um, and this is just some sort of little pinpoints about tradition. Um, G.K. Chesterton, the uh, novelist, um, talked about tradition 
as democracy extended through time. And in the church, of course, there's this idea of the communion of saints, that you are a community across generations, including those who have died and those um, yet to be born. And that's, a, I think, a very healthy way. It's an illustration of the thick present, if you like. Um, attributed to Picasso, uh, tradition is like giving birth, not like wearing your father's hat. And um, then the key idea of the fusion of horizons, which comes from um, a, a hermeneutical understanding. Um, this is uh, Hans-Georg Gadamer. Um, in a tradition, this process of fusion is continually going on. For there, old and new are always combining into something of living value without either being explicitly foregrounded from the other. So the, uh, on that basis, the critique of um, modernity without any thought of history is that it foregrounds um, the the future from from the past the new from the old and the critique of um, a preservation based understanding of conservation is that it foregrounds the old from the new the past from the future and neither of those is is helpful both are extremely harmful um, and we need this uh, balance that a hermeneutical understanding offers on uh, there's Garama and uh, Aristotle also. Uh, Garama's um, building a lot on um, Aristotle, which uh, we'll uh, see in a minute. So two competing methodologies. Um, scientific method. Um, scientific method basically works in one direction, from theory to practice. Um, and Gadamer is sort of reawakening this idea of phrenesis, uh, which goes all the way back to Aristotle, phrenesis or uh, practical wisdom, or the Latin translation is prudentia. And that's about theory to practice going back to theory. So um, both inform the other in, in, in our loop. There's uh, an illustration of Prudencia, we'll come on to her in a minute. Um, so some key sort of aspects of, of a hermeneutical understanding. Um, knowledge comes from and must return to praxis. Um, application is not something that comes along afterwards um, but is sort of stitched into the thing from the beginning so we get away from this dualism of theory and practice um, and the, a distinction between practice and um, techne uh, in, in Aristotle and, uh, and in Gadamer um, and instead we have um, practical wisdom which um, has a high place and transforms our prior communal knowledge. Um, again Juanis was uh, talking about that with respect to you know those those two walls and 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 the disappearance of that communal knowledge uh, but uh, clearly you know it's being much better if it's maintained and the prominent role of human communities um, in developing human judgment um, and all of that has implications for conservation uh, with respect to the doctrinal text all of these charters that we uh, we generate here is uh, just a little bit, uh, an illustration of uh, Prudencia. Uh, this is from Peter Bruegel the Elder. He did a, a cycle of seven, the seven virtues. Um, and th there's some glorious practical stuff in here. She's ready for death. Um, th there's uh, people doing up here, um, you know, this is absolutely sort of the William Morris sort of stave off decay by daily care, you know, prop, prop the thing up. So there's, there's sort of good maintenance going on and, and putting away provisions, uh, you know, ready for when they're needed and trading and etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the thing on, on her head, she has a sieve, which is all about uh, differentiating good from bad. I, I think that's lovely. Um, uh, Prudencia is sort of traditionally described as the charioteer of the virtues um, and represents an integration of, of practice and theory together. It has a really sort of high place for um, uh, craft skills, um, as, as you can see from, uh, from the image, um, and yes, elevates uh, communities as holders of communal knowledge. Just a second sort of expression of um, uh, uh, application of, of these ideas really. Um, uh, I thought uh, it would be an interesting exercise, uh, this was part of my uh, doctoral research when I was doing that, to um, engage with William Morris and the SPAB, his SPAB manifesto from um, uh, 1877. And part of the, it's a polemic, the SPAB manifesto, it's well worth reading, it's just a thousand words, very easy to read. Um, but the problem with it is that it never had anybody pushing back against it, at least in, in my view. It needed somebody to come along and, and sort of engage with it. So uh, I have presented, and in my view, if you take, uh, if you do the honor, William Morris, the honor of taking his words seriously, then actually there's some things to really worry about when you come to a living heritage. So I thought, uh, what would a, a, um, a, a manifesto that um, 
uh, takes living heritage seriously look like? So I, I sort of did this for the Society for the Continu Continuity and Renewal of Ancient Buildings. And there, um, you can go and have a look at that there. Um, and uh, there are sort of four kind of key sort of statements that ancient buildings exude life, they expect change, they embody tradition and they form community. And it starts with a sort of uh, preface um, that says that once a font of community life, um, uh, life is being squeezed from our ancient buildings and that conservation without continuity threatens them with a death called preservation and that living traditions demand change conservation ignores this at its peril. So just before um, I conclude, um, some uh, comments about um, sustainability. Um, and sustainability means all sorts of things to different people. Um, in terms of, uh, in a general sense, cultural sustainability, um, I would suggest that this way of dealing with historic church buildings um, is an effort to make them sustainable, culturally speaking, in the long term, because it takes the local community, the core community, seriously. Sustainability in a, in a more sort of current and narrower sense uh, in terms of um, energy efficiency and uh, a response to the climate crisis um, is uh, also something that uh, churches are very concerned about, church communities are very concerned about. So there's a big debate going on at the moment in England about to what extent these buildings can adopt um, the sort of measures that um, we are going to need to do left, right and centre uh, to our buildings generally uh, if we're going to uh, combat climate change. And um, the theme of uh, next year's FRH um, conference um, is going to be religious heritage and sustainability. So it felt like a good place to end and sort of provide a little bit of a, a pointer towards that. So in this particular, this is um, a church uh, where um, we are doing another uh, scheme of change. It's, it's in process at the moment. We're just about to get the faculty, we believe. Um, but part of the changes here are, um, well, let, let me show you the building first. Um, again, it's a building that's had loads of change all the way through its history, 12th century, 13th, 14th, um, and, and two phases of stuff in the 16th century, stuff happening in the 19th century, etc. And now um, there's, this is the logo that produced by some local children for um, a project to turn it back into a community hub, which is very exciting. And that scheme involves uh, putting in a, in a proper catering kitchen, well, a uh, small kitchen, anyway, um, and some toilets, a, a stair up to a, a ringing gallery. This is where the tower is on the plan. Um, and various other changes. Um, and just looking at the outside of the building, so, so that, that all of that internal stuff is about um, continuity of, uh, of, of, of uh, and more sustainability of the, um, of the cultural uh, nature. But on the outside, it is also proposed to put uh, photovoltaic panels on the roofs. And that is likely to be, we haven't yet got our planning permission for that, which we also need but that's likely to be acceptable because basically you can't see them from anywhere. So that's generally speaking possible now, even though this is a, a grade one listed building. And then secondly, in terms of the way the building will be heated, there'll be an air source heat pump outside. Again, still needs to get permission, but again, likely to be uh, acceptable. So finally, um, just to end uh, with some principles drawn from uh, what we've uh, done as, um, uh, my definition of heritage is the nexus or literally the binding together of people and place. So that chimes very much with uh, what one is uh, said in, in terms of the aim of conservation being the safeguarding of the connection between the, the community and the built heritage. Um, and also um, supporting the continual creation of heritage. I see um, three aspects of living heritage. Um, that it accounts for continuity um, through change and across time. It allows for a voice uh, and ownership by uh, the community, not just the uh, individual expert or specialist. And it frames histor a historic building as mid-narrative, i.e. the narrative hasn't finished yet. It's not a completed biography. Um, and by doing so, it allows for future cultural production. So uh, the last word goes to uh, the Frankish King Lothar. We said, uh, apparently, um, all things change and we change with them. Thank you. That's it.
many thanks, uh, Nigel, for this wonderful presentation uh, and for addressing this narrative approach. Uh, you shared many beautiful quotes from many various angles, all addressing how this uh, change can or, or could be conducted. And I especially like this quote uh, that you did of Schumacher of the difficulty that conservation has in understanding living buildings or the Thomas Hardy quote about the different perceptions that different people have and different understandings of the building. And uh, overall, you signaled this importance of uh, cultural continuity and the importance of change for living traditions. And, um, and also many thanks for introducing the theme of sustainability, which as you also indicated, will be the theme of next year's uh, FRHB annual conference, which we hope uh, everybody will attend. So um, now maybe we can open the floor uh, with, um, I, I believe Cristina Gutierrez had a, a question. But um, yes, if there's any other question uh, for this particular second session as well, feel free to share any question. Uh, I see if there's, there was a hand raised. Feel free to just unmute yourself if um, you would like to raise a question. I think Lillian has her hand up. Yes, uh, Lillian? No, maybe not. Okay, maybe I can uh, just uh, ask a short question about your, your second presentation. When you mentioned that uh, living traditions are, are so, uh, that change is so important for living traditions, how do you think that these uh, what, what goes faster, the change in the living tradition or the change of the of the space to adapt to this uh, tradition? Um, well, now that uh, the, the in, in, in if you uh, living traditions don't necessarily mean working in a historic building, but in those situations where you are working in a historic building, then um, the uh, the pressure, the, the change will only happen to the building if the community has already begun, begun that change, or that, that should be the way, it, the way it is. Sometimes you get, uh, I, I see schemes where essentially a, a church community is saying, um, you know, if we build it, they will come, you know, so we need to make these changes in order to be able to start doing community stuff, um, you know, so whatever, and that's always a bit suspicious to me it's much better to change a building once there's proof so once for example you know they're already ha having a mothers and toddlers group within the building and they've come up against the problems um, that they can't uh, you know change because the various things you know the pews are in the way or whatever it is um, then that's the time to make the change so um, I, I would see the um, change to the building following after the change in the community if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um, I see, I oh, know this was a comment uh, in the chat. So per perhaps uh, if there's no other question. I yet. don't know if you need ah, to give yes. me the floor. Ah, do sorry. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Yes. Do you listen to me? It's okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Listen. First, congratulations. I. I would like to make a, a question and a, and a suggestion. I, in the many years that I have been working in the, in the management of heritage, we have some in Spain good success about a fusion of a religious function of the building, keeping the, the, the same use and at the same to have an, uh, an open uh, capacity to tourism, something like that. I, I believe that the case of, of Matera, that the matter is, is something that I believe that we need to dig and to study more the relation between function and keeping the building, a restoration. Because the building without the original function is not a, really, a, a real heritage, complete heritage. The number one, the premium we could say of heritage is to keep the building with the same function. And in religious heritage, is, this is more important because generally 
All religion has its, its ritual, ritual related with the chapels, with the, with the car, clusters, with the places, with the, in, in many churches, like for instance, the nuns or churches of nuns and the convents, they have even a ritual and, and songs and, and music related with the time of the year, with the place and the different, because a, a convent is like a city. So I believe that perhaps as association, we should dig and, and work a little more about the need and how we could spread the idea of the, the best building is what we keep the use and the function. And they, we need to send this message to municipalities, to the authorities, and even to the UNESCO, because many restorations are like, believe that the buildings are cases, boxes, boxes that they could do everything inside. So the narrative is cut because at the end, heritage is visual and we cannot see what it is there. So my suggestion is that how we can start a work in this line. First, second question about Matera. Who was the authority who pressed the, 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 the they were, it was a male comment, I believe. Who was the press to the owners of the building, the old building? It was the municipality who wanted to, to build this hotel there. Who was? Because in this case, we could denounce at the bad practices. When the municipality, because the comments are very weak, they have no money, they have no lobbies, the society is, is in his new life. And I believe that we need to protect them and to condemn this pressure of the of the politicians of the municipalities and the society against this kind of comments. How we could you know, start thinking about a way of protect this kind of societies. One is, do you, do you want to answer about uh, Meteora first? I don't know. Yonis. Uh, thank you, Christina, for the question. Meteora is a um... Is a more complex example. All these unauthorized. You refer to the unauthorized uh, buildings. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. These unauthorized buildings were built by the monks and the nuns. Um, they want the money. <laughs> the issue is as follows: is that um, uh, the issue of Meteora is that um, Meteora are monasteries on top of rocks, so yes. the space is limited. Yes. So the monastic community, the, the nuns, uh, complained they needed more space in order to perform their rituals, their everyday practices. However, the reality is a bit different. The arrangement of space on this particular monastery sites that um, tourism, the presence of tourists does not allow the monks to lead their life. Hmm. So it was not the need of monks for more space. It was in fact the inability of nuns to deal with tourism development. Yes. So because of that, they need more space. And um, what they did is that they did not go through the official procedures. Uh, you know, having the acceptance by the heritage authorities yeah. because they had money. How, oh, yeah. how did they have money? Because of tourism. Oh, yeah. Meteor is one of the very few uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites where all entrance fees do not go to the heritage authorities to the Ministry of Culture, let's say, mm. all goes to the monastic community. Yeah. So the nuns had money from the entrance fees. The nuns had money from the museum shops. They operate within their monasteries. The nuns had money from the, you know, the dedications, the devotions of pilgrims uh, when they go and you know they light a candle, etc., they make their prayers. 
they give money, they offer money, the offerings of money. So they have three big sources of making money. So mm -hmm. the nuns had a lot of money and they could afford the construction yeah. of this Horrible. further this space. Is, this is a tragedy. They, they killed themselves. They went to the to some local uh, architect. Yeah. They paid him, so the local architect prepared all the plans, etc. And then they started building the, the buildings. The issue is that the local com community and even local judges, etc., even the guards, the archaeological, the guards of the archaeological service never saw these buildings because of their connections with their connections with the uh, their connections with spiritual uh, commercial connections, etc., with the monastic community. So nobody saw these buildings. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> love. <laughs> yes, my daughter. So nobody saw these buildings, which is even more incredible. Yeah. No, this is extraordinary. This is, this is a bad example. And the archaeological authorities, at the end, they saw these buildings and they said, OK, since we are on the third floor you know, layer, let them story, let them complete. I mean, this is not the way no. it should operate. But this was the story about a lot of factors linked to each other in order to have this yeah. bad. Uh, Thank you. Example. And in fact, this is one of the monastic communities that has less money out of the other. Yeah. Meteora monasteries. There are monastic communities who, which have more money. Yeah. Than this yeah. one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. In, in terms of a um, an English context, um, you just couldn't do that um, because every um, so alongside the um, the church system of permission the faculty system for, for the Church of England if you do any make any changes to the outside of a building then you also need planning permission so and that needs to go through the normal planning process and you know so there are lots of opportunities to stop bad things happening like that I suppose in sorry terms of... to interrupt you. Uh, similar properties are also in the Greek system, but uh, sometimes it happens. <laughs> sometimes it happens. Um, and in terms of um, in terms of tourism, um, I mean, the, so bigger churches would have potentially you know, d work to um, encourage, you know, tourist visits that they would often, um, they'd often sort of produce like a sort of church trail sort of, for, for, you know, a, a walk between different, um, different church buildings in the area. Um, they might have a, you know, sort of bit of a bookshop or a bit of a, you know, sort of little cafe sort of thing, but it's, uh, yeah, not nothing. I mean, there isn't a sort of pilgrimage culture in the, in the same way in, in Britain anymore. Than there, you know, as there may be perhaps in uh, in your case there. But you are one of the best countries in managing heritage. You mm -hmm. have a lot of, of organizations to keep it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But perhaps I'm thinking that perhaps we could organize in, in Spain with you, with the association, some good examples. But at the same time, for me, one of the tragedies are the, the populated areas. Because we have places where the, the really the the, the village has not population, no inhabitants. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what, what we do with the churches? Mm -hmm. Even I believe that we can, in, 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 in 10 years, the thing is going to be worst. Mm. And uh, we have not uh, organized in Europe anything to, to protect them. For me, mm -hmm. we could go perhaps to the commission with a program. I need to speak with Lillian that I congratulate her for her how she's working in the association and also, also Jordi, how we can organize, and I believe that we can organize through digital system, the control of the churches that are not 
in, in village wars and there is no population. A comment on my part on that, uh, um, Nigel and Christina, is that this uh, management of tourism is a very tricky issue. You, I mean, Nigel, you referred, you know, bigger churches, etc. It does not have to do with uh, the size because we tend to see uh, the control of tourism and carrying capacity, as we tend to call it, in, um, in terms of the tangible space. I think it would be better to see that in terms of intangible elements. Just to give you an element, uh, an example. In my house, okay, uh, let's say the living room and, uh, the, um, and the kitchen are connected. This means that even one visitor can upset the function, the normal function of my house, of my home, mm. which means that, you know, the structure is as follows, is that if I have one visitor, I cannot use the kitchen. Mm. I cannot prepare food. I cannot watch TV, etc. In religious sites, even five tourists can upset the functioning of uh, a religious, of a ritual. So it's how, even if a church can accommodate, the church building can accommodate 200 visitors, 200 tourists, even yes. five of them can upset the rituals. And to tell the truth, I was amazed. Every time that I go to the Vatican in Rome, they have a very well advanced way of um, accommodating religious rituals, um, the, um, the people, the local community that attend the religious rituals and should be respected and at the, time, and at the same time, yes. the tourists. It's not easy to do that. So let us not think only in terms of size of buildings, etc., but trying to combine these diverse functions together is not always... I know. I know, uh, but we have good cases. Tourists can upset the whole ceremony. Yes, but we can have a lot of, of, of success solutions. Perhaps we don't know them. Listen, one thing that is specific of the religious ceremonies is that they are a, have a calendar. All the rituals have a calendar. During the week, during the day, and during the year. So... I believe that it's not very difficult to combine. The idea is that we don't work together, the society, the church, the local authorities. And at the same time, we live in a society that, and even many institutions like UNESCO, they want to be independent, so they don't want to speak about religion. But the living heritage that I like, the, the, the two words linked, means that we can understand the building and the fusion, that is one of the items and the concept that is a key in the politic of your disassociation. That is what I like, because they understand function. And that is why they believe that is a line that we could start, uh, continue working in this line. Because a convent, as I told before, they have, I prefer the nuns singing their own music the music of the, the time that the building was built in the same space with the same sound and many things like that. I believe that we need to work in this effort. That is what we are doing, really. So congratulations again. And thank you very much. Lilian, tell something. Thank you. Some other comments, some other uh, to <laughs> Nigel or to me. Yes, of course, Giovanna. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much to both um, speakers because uh, your uh, your presentation was so uh, so so plenty of also um, inspirations. I I I I am especially concerned about about the future because we talk so much about the past and Nigel rightly talks you you both talks about this horizon this fusion of horizon I I really believe that Gadamer's yeah. figure is a good way of thinking about the 
the, the, the future of religious heritage. I would like, how do you see the, the, in, the, in the words of uh, Ioannis, the, the, future, the future of core community uh, and how to, because finally we, ha we have dealing with the believers because uh, the core community is also a community of, uh, the, 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 the community of believers. How do you, I, how do you think about this, uh, these future generations? Both, thank you. So for, from my point of view, please. Um, the, so uh, I, I, am, I am also part of a church, so I, uh, and that's part of the reason I have ended up in this area of work. And to me, it's, you know, sometimes when you, when you come to a church, um, the attitude is very negative. And you know the, the attitude towards the building is often as long as we can keep the building open until I've had my funeral, then that that's enough for me type thing, you know, which is which is you know the, the opposite of looking to the future, um, and uh, the along with the approach that I take to conservation, part another part of what I see my role to be is um, helping churches rethink their approach to their buildings and to become in that process to become more future facing with respect to their buildings now you can't you can't take a church community and transform it into something that's going to last into the future i mean that's not the job of an architect or a heritage professional but i would say that the it's uh, the it comes back to that sort of image of dance um that there is something about uh, a religious community being rooted in a place which then means that it has a building, often a historic building. And there is something quite powerful, I think, in the relationship between the church community and its physical building, which has a big impact on its future. If, if they're fighting against their building, it's gonna be much more difficult for them to replicate and carry on in the future, you know, with you know, fresh generations of people than if, because they will turn in on themselves, and if they turn in on themselves because of the building, then they're going to be pushing people away. So, so there's there's an acknowledgement that we can't. There's only so much we can do. But also, actually, there is something quite important in that space, in that nexus, as, as I described it, of of people and place, that does I think have an impact on the on the future of the community. One is. Hmm. I will be more philosophical. Allow me, uh, Giovanna. I think that the future of religious heritage is uh, directly linked to the future of religion. So if we, I, I refer to the Asian and African reality, if I now, uh, given our interest in, um, in Europe, in the Western world, hmm, what is the future of religion in the Western world? I think that uh, uh, it will decrease the importance of, um, religions. I think this will make a lot of uh, religious buildings need to be converted into restaurants, cafes, etc. And they will be mostly seen as uh, heritage or, you know, uh, cafes or restaurants that respect the fabric, etc. And there will be some stories of uh, uh, the religious use somewhere in the, you know, on some labels, etc. But I believe that uh, um, the coming of you know artificial intelligence and robots, uh, I think this would mean um, would make a lot of uh, uh, yeah. In the Netherlands, one thousand seven hundred of the steel seven thousand in function are expected to be taken out of religious use. You see what we are discussing. Thank you, uh, uh, Linian, for this. Uh, um, I think that with the come with the coming of the ro artificial intelligence, especially of robots, then um, uh, we as human beings would try to get back to some of our core principles, and I think that religion will will be um, a part of that. So for the next years or decades, I will see a downgrade, but afterwards I will see uh, 
because of that, I will see an upgrade in the Western world. This is my, sorry, it's not a prophecy, it's not a messianic or whatever, but this is the way I see things. To tell the truth, I believe a lot in the coming of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and robots because this coming will challenge a lot of our uh, views and trends in the last decades uh, as human beings. Um, so this would be a next shift, a big shift in the, uh, in the management of living religious heritage. Uh, it might sound a bit, uh, you know, out of the blue, but yeah, this is my view. Any thanks? Uh, I wonder, is there any other question or remark, comment? I would like to give one comment on the last, uh, if possible, Jordi, I don't know. Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Um, of course, uh, what Joanna said, uh, we did research here in the Netherlands, spirituality is rising enormously. Uh, in 2018, in the Vatican, uh, on the conference on reuse organized by the Pontifical Council, which, by the way, now organizes a very uh, uh, special uh, meeting again, I put it in the chat, one can still register, but this is more on monist monastic life. Um, uh, it was very clear that nowadays um, um, religion is declining or increasing, as Joanna said, in, uh, in the Catholic Church in, in the Western Europe, and, in, and in, so in Europe as a whole, but it's still growing in other countries like Africa, Asia, and in other. And, and what is happening now in the Netherlands, at least what I see, is that in the beginning, uh, the Dutch monks and, and priests were sent to Africa, Asia, and everywhere. And nowadays, priests are coming back from these countries uh, to, to preach in our country. So it is, it is a, a kind of, so I would like to believe, Johannes, uh, your future thought that maybe at some, time, some point it might change again. But the, the, the thing is that in the Netherlands, although we have already 15 or 1600 converted religious buildings in many different ways, um, uh, we now seem to come to the, I don't know, the insight or the conclusion uh, more in line with both of your introductions or, or both of your uh, uh, contributions today that if you do not know exactly anymore what has been happening in these buildings and what the purpose was specifically. Um, also, you know, going back to the past, the medieval time or whatever, the, the, uh, then you lose them forever. Mm. So it before it was more, the overload was more on the heritage perspective or for those who are not listed, uh, just saying, well, this is a box and you can do something within this box. But now it seems as, as we are going backwards so fast and so many buildings are closing, it seems to be uh, that there is a change in the mindset. It seems to be there is the kind of, um, that people realize you have to go back. If you don't understand anymore, if, if you are not open anymore, if you do not invite people, if they do not understand what the objects means or the artifacts or, or, or the stories related, if you do not bring them together, then uh, then it's lost, and then you rather you you can just demolish immediately. And there is now also in my country, uh, people are not pleased with demolition any longer. So uh, there is a kind of change of views. So maybe indeed, uh, Johannes, uh, but that's always uh, in the Netherlands. I don't know how this uh, in the, in the in English <laughs> is done, but. Uh, in the Netherlands, there is the saying, "Als het kalf verdronken is, dan men de put." So when the calf has, has has been drowning in the in the in the well, then one starts realizing what is lost, you know. Uh, so so I think in the Netherlands, after so many um, changes of buildings, 
Uh, and now that there is a kind of push, uh, many, many will become abandoned. We know this, uh, there's research and whatever this is happening. Also the churches indicating this will happen from 325 uh, buildings. They only want to use 25 within five years or something. They know already. Uh, one starts to realize that we should set up a different approach than we did before. Another issue, allow me, Lina, to say another trend that I see is that um, so far we had, um, um, yeah, yeah, Giovanna, you're right, in this neoliberal context to competition for tourist attractions. Another, this is another trend, of course, tourism, but another trend is that the, in some places there is an increase in spirituality or spiritual movements, but this spirituality or spiritual movements are not um, in line with the specific uh, religious movements that gave birth with Christianity, with, uh, you understand what I'm trying to say? So possibly this new alternative, name them, new age, whatever, just name them, spiritual movements might get back to, the, um, to these religious sites in a kind of different way, they would see them as spiritual energy spaces, etc. This would be another that I'm still trying to find out, and I don't know whether th there is any research on that. So spirituality might increase in Western Europe, but in a different context. Yeah. They would, uh, these new spiritual communities would look upon the Christian buildings, let's say, or Muslim uh, buildings in a different way. But I think we need more research into that. These are more or less the tendencies. And as Lillian said, all this is happening rapidly. Yeah. It's not a matter of uh, 50 years. It's not a matter of uh, 30 years. It's a matter of the next 10 years or even less. Okay. The, 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 the situation will change this very, very rapidly. Well, just, just to touch up on this, because we did a, a big research the last three years by the government in the Netherlands, so, so that's why we now have very accurate figures or very actual uh, points of views. One of the points of views is that there are many, many new Dutch people, you know, they are already living here, they bring their new religion, eh, as you say, spirituality. But they, they are not allowed to use these buildings. So this is from the ecclesiastical point of view, because if you are not a member of the church of whatever, uh, it's a Protestant, and if you are not in this um, environment, uh, they are not willing to give you. And I have examples, for instance, there is an Eritrean church, and they have enormous amount of followers. And so now somebody in the Netherlands did buy a church from the diocese, and after that, he bought a church from the diocese, he opened up for this new community. And it is now inhabiting. But, you know, the diocese is not pleased about these things. But uh, at a certain moment, probably they will open up. And also what we see now, for instance, uh, the immigrants coming and now even from the Ukrainian war, it's a real pity. But we also have a lot of Polish people already in the Netherlands working and, and uh, Spanish people and whatever. They would like to go to mass with their own priest. And they can inhabit these buildings, but it seems as if there is still a threshold from the ecclesiastic, ecclesiastical point of view to invite them in. So, so but this is also rapidly changing. Eh? It's just touching up you. This, these are new rapidly insights because in the Netherlands, one also now recognizes the best use of such a building is a religious related use. So even if it is maybe a different type of religion or not exactly the same, it is still a better use than, than house building or, or whatever. I, I don't know, um, trampoline jumping or whatever, because we have all of these in the Netherlands. Eh? Yeah. But yeah these are I, would be, I would be very interested in this uh, research. If it is open access, please share it with me because, uh, you know, I, I'm aware of these issues, but it's important to have some research uh, results on that. These are the issues. Yes, you're right. This is these are the issues. It's a very complex uh, thing. I mean, uh, another thing is how I mean monks and nuns. All this is about um, how could I say? It's about sacred space. It's about spaces associated with God. 
faith is something divine. I mean, we as conservation professionals, to tell the truth, I realized that after a lot of years of exposure and experience in the field, we are trying to manage something that is kind of divine. This is very, very difficult by nature. So I think that we should not be um, surprised by all these changes that we are talking, even these dramatic, rapid changes, because by nature, what we are trying to do is very, very difficult, inherently difficult. We are managing divine spaces. We are trying to deal with monks, nuns, religious communities, and whose aim is to be connected with God. This is very, very difficult in the first place. And this is the most, uh, is the biggest difficulty. And we have, we are already addressing this difficulty. So the difficulties that we, we, we refer to right now about the future, etc., are much smaller difficulties rather than that is always there. We are dealing with, with divine spaces. It's, I think this was, uh, I think that living religious heritage is the, is the space where science, where faith, um, where um, professionals, where uh, saints intervene. It is this space and it's a difficult space. I think that religious heritage is the most difficult type of heritage that we are trying to to deal with especially because of this because it's a divine uh, space even if it is christian or hindu or buddhist or whatever it is a divine space and this is the most difficult thing so we should not be concerned i mean we should not be afraid of the changes that come this is uh, this will be my final uh, comment on this uh, very interesting session. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes, and thank you very much, Nigel. I see we're already a few minutes over time, and of course, uh, I'm sure everybody would love to continue this very interesting discussion, but we need to uh, close at some point. So I would like to uh, wholeheartedly thank you, uh, Niter Walter and Johannes Polius for conducting this excellent masterclass. It was a, a truly relevant uh, subject matter. It touched upon all these very timely issues and the challenges facing religious heritage sites uh, in the future as you well uh, touched upon. Um, also many thanks to the participants for joining us today and for the interesting questions you raised and the reflections you shared. And uh, we invite you all to join us for all upcoming FRA events. Uh, you can always find them on our website here in uh, upcoming events. And this masterclass recording will also be shared with all FRH members in the coming days for those that might have joined late today or those members that were unable to attend. So um, again, thank you very much to everyone. And um, see you next time and have a good evening. Thank Goodbye. You, thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.